Just a couple of quick notes as we uh, begin our time of prayer today. Uh, first of all, we want to continue to remember in our prayers uh, the people of Myanmar, uh, the people of Burma, and, and especially our brothers and sisters here at Tigre Ni, uh, Karen Baptist Church, as they have uh, friends and family members uh, suffering there. Um, if, you're, if you're not sure uh, what's going on there, there's been a, a military coup and, uh, and a great persecution going on right now. So deteriorating situation. If you would continue to keep them uh, in your prayers with us. Um, and also uh, wanted to take just just a moment uh, to mark, uh, to mark a, a, a tragic milestone uh, that this, this week, uh, we passed 500,000 uh, COVID deaths in the United States alone. Um, just uh, continue to keep uh, the folks uh, suffering from that in your prayers. Continue to keep uh, the medical workers and those uh, continuing to work their regular jobs through it. Um, the difficult uh, situations that many people are facing now. And also, uh, just again, a reminder uh, to, to be praying with the Doris Ott family. They had uh, her memorial this past week. Uh, continue to pray with all those who are, have been recently bereaved. Would you all join me in prayer today? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful weather, God. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to gather uh, when, when we are, are not able to be uh, together so often, um, the time is sweeter when we are. So God, I just thank you for those who are able to gather in the building today uh, and for the opportunity to do that. And God, we thank you for those who are not able. Uh, we thank you for their faithfulness and for their perseverance. And we ask that you would continue to be with them as they meet with us online and over the phone. God, we just ask that you would be with all those who cannot due to sickness or injury, uh, due to ill health, due to recovery or due to bereavement. God, we ask that you would be with all those who cannot be with us today. We ask that you would give them a special experience of your presence. God, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to you and to what you would be doing in us and through us today. We ask that you would continue to grow us into the likeness of your son, that you would make us more like Jesus through our worship and through our praise, through our prayers and through our preaching. God, we ask that we would continually be made more like you. Creator, redeemer, sustainer, God, we want to move through this day in union with you. So we ask that you would draw our hearts, that you would guide our minds. We ask that you would fill our imaginations. We ask that you would rule over our wills and bodies so that we might be more aware of and more responsive to you. Filled with your life and love, filled with your strength and peace for your glory and the good of all, including our own. And God, we thank you most of all for your son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. I just want to say a, thank, a quick thank you uh, again to our praise team. Um, the, we didn't have everybody here. It's been a while since we've had everybody here. And so uh, just having everyone back together again uh, makes it more, more easy and obvious to tell the difference. So we thank you so much for your, for your continued work, uh, for your faithfulness, um, for what you bring to this church. We appreciate it greatly. We are going to be in Luke chapter 13 today, uh, continuing on our journey to God. 
there are a couple of different narratives here that, that may seem not to have a lot to do with one another. Um, and we are going to skip a little bit of space in the middle. But hopefully we'll be able to draw some of those connections to see uh, why they are uh, together in the same chapter and to, to see what we can learn from them today. In the mid to late 1930s, in rural England, there was a wealthy land landowner named Edith Pretty. Um, she had on her land uh, a number of mounds uh, that they suspected were burial mounds of some sort, but they didn't really know for sure what they were. And so she wanted to have them excavated. She was actually somewhat of an amateur archaeologist herself, and she knew a little bit about excavation. And she wanted to have somebody come in and do the excavation for her. But although she was a wealthy landowner, she didn't have enough money to hire a professional archaeologist, uh, which would have been a highly, highly paid position at the time, one that took uh, a number of professional, uh, professional qualifications and a specific type of education. And so what she ended up finding was uh, a guy named Basil Brown. Now, Basil Brown was an autodidact. He was self-taught as an archaeologist. He knew a number of different languages, and his father before him had worked as an excavator, and his grandfather before him had worked as an excavator. So anytime there was an archaeological dig, they could be uh, trusted to be there and to work on the physical act of digging. And so Basil Brown had trained himself in ancient languages, in the uh, soil styles of uh, of their specific place, their specific location in England, and he knew a, a great deal about archaeology, although he was technically an amateur. And so Edith Pretty hired Basil Brown to do this excavation. And for uh, weeks and for months leading up to World War II, actually, as the world was falling apart around them, they worked on an excavation on one of these burial mounds and eventually found an old ship that had been buried. Now, many people at the time assumed that it was a Viking ship. There had been a number of Viking ships buried around this time, but Basil Brown actually believed it was much older, that this was an Anglo-Saxon burial ship, that underneath the ship itself, uh, there would have been a burial chamber. And if that was true, if this was, in fact, an Anglo-Saxon burial mound, this would have been the archaeological find of the decade. At least something that the British Museum would want to come in and would want to, uh, would want to find more about and would actually want to take all of the, the artifacts that they found and bring them into the British Museum itself. And it turned out to be exactly that. It turned out to be one of the most ancient archaeological finds of the 1930s. And the British Museum came in and took over the excavation. The head of the British Museum himself supervised the excavation, affirmed it as an Anglo-Saxon burial mound. And Basil Brown was forgotten to history. Nobody knew that he was the one who excavated the site. Nobody knew that he was the one who had actually, uh, who had actually guessed or, or made the prediction that it was going to be an Anglo-Saxon rather than a Viking burial mound. Basil Brown was the one who had supervised the excavation, who had done all the work, all the difficult and painstaking work for months. And then somebody else swooped in, finished it off, and took the credit. Now, there seems to be a grave injustice here. It is frustrating and difficult to see someone who should get the credit for their good work being completely forgotten by history. It is frustrating to see someone who did not do the hard work coming in and taking the credit for it. And there is this, there is this pain that we have involved in seeing someone not get 
what they deserve. Or somebody get what they absolutely did not deserve. There is this deep sense of injustice about Basil Brown not getting what he deserved until decades, almost a century later, when the nephew of someone else involved in the Hutton II archaeological dig went on to write a book about it, and we learned the name of Basil Brown. We want, deep in our deepest hearts, we want to get what we deserve, as long as it's something good. Of course, when we deserve something bad, we want someone else to get that. But we deep, deep in our hearts, want to see justice done. We want to see good rewarded. We want to see bad punished. In Luke 13, we hear Jesus talking about justice. We hear Jesus talking about people getting what they deserve and people not getting what they deserve. When that's a good thing, when that is a bad thing. So follow along with me for just a few minutes. We're going to be reading in Luke chapter 13 about justice. And we're going to see what Jesus has to say about it and what we might be able to learn from it. Luke chapter 13, starting with verse 1. At that very time, there were some present who told him, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And then we're going to jump to verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. May God bless the reading and hearing of just a portion of God's word. Jesus begins by talking about justice, about seeing good done, about people getting what they deserve. And Jesus starts out by saying something counterintuitive. Traditional wisdom is that good is rewarded and bad is punished. You see this all the way through the Proverbs, all the way through the Psalms, all the way through the wisdom literature of the Hebrew Bible, that when we do good, God will reward us. And when we do bad, God will punish us. And there is truth in that, right? It is true that there are consequences 
for our actions. It is true that when we do wrong, naturally, consequences will occur. When we live in wrong ways, when we live in wrong relationship to God, in wrong relationship to the people around us, we reap the fruit of that kind of behavior. And yet, is it always true that bad is punished in this life? Is it always true that evil has its consequence? Life doesn't always work that way, does it? We desperately, desperately want to see justice done. And yet, so often, people who do rank injustice, people who oppress, people who kill, are not held to the standard that we would like for them to be held to and we mourn and we grieve when we do not see justice done. We mourn when people don't get what they deserve. And yet other times people who have done no visible wrong, people who live the right way, people who do God's will, people who live in right relationship to God, and to others, and to creation. Die all too young. That's just the way life works sometimes, isn't it? There is truth. There is truth to the idea that good is rewarded and bad is punished. But that is not the way it always happens. And so what does Jesus say about that? He said, these people whose blood was mixed with the sacrifices they offered at the temple. Were they worse than the other people of Jerusalem? No. Or the 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell, these people who underwent this disaster, does that mean they did wrong? Does that mean they were bad? Did they deserve what they got? No. No, Jesus says. And yet, and yet, repent. Repent. Because the consequences of our behavior will be rewarded, will be punished, will be made real. There are very real consequences for our behavior. The takeaway for Jesus here in the... uh, and the people who died unjustly. The takeaway there is not, it doesn't matter what you do. The takeaway for Jesus is not because, because the good are not always rewarded, because the bad are not always punished, it doesn't matter. Jesus says, repent. Turn around 180 degrees. Stop facing injustice. Stop facing evil. And start facing back towards the God we see in Jesus, the God who loves, the God of compassion, the God who sacrifices for, the God who empties himself for. Repent, Jesus says. There will be consequences for our actions. And Jesus asks then, To see the result of that repentance. We have this really weird story about a fig tree, right? And Jesus says that for for three years, this fig tree has not borne fruit. It has not given the life that the fig tree was supposed to give. For three years, it has not. And so in the parable, they say, well, then cut it down. Get rid of the tree. And in the parable, they say, give us one more year. One more year to bear fruit. One more year to be who and what we are supposed to be. And it's interesting to me. It's interesting to me. What they say in the parable is going to happen to the tree. They say, we're going to dig around it and put put manure on it. Is it all right to think that's funny? 
that the process of the tree becoming fruitful, the process of the tree becoming fruitful is digging around it and putting manure on the tree. Now, this was often a, a symbol. Trees often were symbols of nations at the time. And so the fig tree as a symbol of the nation of Israel, a fig tree as a symbol of, as a manifestation of the people of God, Jesus was saying, I have lived my whole life. I have had this three years of ministry. And in this time, the people of God have not acted like the people of God. I have called you to love. I have called you to compassion. I have called you to justice, and yet you have not borne fruit, Jesus is saying. And so there will be a time of digging. There will be a time of manure in order for the tree to become fruitful. Jesus is saying, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Repent, yes, Turn away from your sin. The things that we do that damage our relationships with God and with ourselves. The things that we do that damage our relationships with people and God's creation. Repent. Turn around. Turn away from those things. And then bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Live a life changed by God's good news. Now that is not something we can just make happen. It's easy to say, bear fruit, but it does not many matter how many times I yell at this poinsettia, it is not going to bear fruit. It does not matter how many times I tell it, it cannot bear fruit. Why? Because it's plastic, but that's not the point. The point is that God is calling us to bear fruit, and that is not something that we can shout our way into. That is not something we can try our way into. That is not something that we can work our way into. Bearing fruit is the consequence of God's life in us. Working its way out through us. We study the Bible. We worship. Not just so that we would know things in our heads. But so that God's life would be present in us. And would work its way out through us. Into the world around us. That as Peter said in his letters. We could participate in the divine life. We are given a chance to bear fruit. And then we have. Then we have in my estimation. One of the most interesting. One of the most fascinating images of the love of God. Because after all, if we are on a journey towards God, if this entire life is about us moving toward God so that we can experience God's life in us and that we can bear fruit so that the people around us can experience the love of God. If our entire life is a journey towards God, it is worth asking Who started it? It's worth asking where the journey begins, how the journey begins. And here we have Jesus giving us this image of God all over Scripture. We have an image of God as Father. God as one who loves and cares for. God as one who provides for. And here we have an image of God as Mother. The mother hen wrapping us up in her wings. How often, Jesus said, I would have gathered you under my wings as a mother hen. The initiative, the initiative in the relationship between us and God begins with God. God's love pursues. God's love overcomes. God's love chases after us even when we are Running the other way. How often, Jesus said, would I have gathered you under my wings as a mother hen? We are not always chasing after God. We are not always bearing the fruit that we should. 
We are not always living the way that we should. We are not always even open to God working in us and through us the way that we should be. And what does Jesus say about those times in our lives when we have turned away, when we're not producing fruit? Jesus said, even in those times, I would have gathered you under my wings as a mother hen. God's love pursues us. God's love chases after us. God's love is big enough for our questions and our doubts. God's love is big enough for our sin and our disobedience. God's love is big enough to encompass even those who killed him. God's love is big enough to handle whatever we throw about, throw at it. And even then, Jesus said, he would have gathered us under his wings as a mother hen. If we are on a journey towards God, if we are moving towards an understanding of life and creation as an unfolding towards God, we do well to remember that we didn't start it. God started it. God made the first move towards us. And our responsibility anytime and always is to turn back towards God. Anytime and always our responsibility is to repent. Always and anytime. God is open to us. There is nothing that we are or can be or can do that is outside of God's love for us. It can be outside of God's purpose for us, but never outside of God's love. How often, Jesus said, I would have gathered you under my wings. And yet, and yet you would not. We still have the responsibility. We still have the opportunity to turn towards God. To repent, as Jesus says, to bear fruit, and to take solace in the loving arms and embrace of God. So my invitation to you today is to accept what Christ has done for you. Accept the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. To accept God's embrace. To accept the overcoming love of God for you. To repent. To bear fruit. And to turn continually towards God. With your questions, yes. With your doubts, absolutely. God can handle these things. Just because somebody beside you doesn't have the same questions you have, doesn't have the same answers that you would like them to have, does not mean no one does. Does not mean God does not. Just means we are limited and finite people. I invite you to turn to God whenever, wherever you are. Whenever, wherever you realize you are turned away. It's never too late to turn back to God. There's a really interesting story in scripture about second chances. About the opportunity to turn back towards God. And it's Jonah. Story of Jonah. Now we all know this story, right? The story is about an asparagus. Wait, that's not an asparagus. That's a very specific version of that story. It's about a prophet of God who is given a task to go and tell this group of people about who God is and what God has for them. And Jonah says, no, I'm not going to do it. Jonah says, this group of people is too far gone. This group of people, you don't, you don't know, God, what this group of people has done. And so I'm going to save you the time of you being rejected by this group of people. And I am going to go in the opposite direction. And God pursues. God chases after Jonah. 
So Jonah ends up in front of the Ninevites and Jonah tells them, you know what? I don't want to be here, but God told me if you don't straighten up, if you don't get your act together, if you don't stop killing people, if you don't stop hurting the people around you, if you don't stop the injustice that is rank and rampant in your culture, here are the things that are going to happen. And they said, we had no idea. Absolutely. We will fix it. We will repent. We will turn back towards the God you are telling us about. And we will stop what we are doing. And then Jonah rejoiced, right? (laughs) Twist ending. Jonah did not rejoice. Jonah was upset. He was mad. He said, why are you giving this group of people, of all people, a second chance? And then the story ends. The story ends with Jonah mad about people being given second chances. And so as we are thinking about us turning back towards God, There's always the question we need to ask, and and that's where are we in this story? Are we someone who needs to repent? Are we someone who continually has unchristlikeness in us? Are we someone who needs to turn back towards God the way the Ninevites did? And it doesn't have to be in a big and bombastic way that the Ninevites had it or needed it. Often these are Small things, small versions of holding up someone or something else as an idol, as a God for us. Often these are small things, decisions that we make, habits that we have, besetting sins, things that we do time after time after time, unthinking, on autopilot, that are not the ways that God would have us to live. But we also need to ask ourselves if we're Jonah in this story. If we look at the world around us and we don't particularly want them to repent. We see people we disagree with, people we're angry at, people that we think have done gross wrong. And we don't particularly want them to turn back to God. And that too is something that needs repented of. Bitterness and hatred need to be repented of as well. Because thank God, God is a God of second chances. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet far from God, God pursued us. And we hope and pray that God will continue to do that for those around us and even for us. As we stray, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Would you all join me in prayer today? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you pursue us even when we are far away. God, we thank you that you are big enough for our questions and our doubts. God, we thank you that you are big enough for our differences. We ask that you would continue, continue to send your Holy Spirit to us. We ask that we would continue to invite your Holy Spirit into us and that we might in that way continue to bear fruit for this day and all the days to come. God, we ask that you would be with our community. We ask that you would be with our nation. We ask that you would be with our world. We ask that you would continue to send Jonas. And we ask that we would continue to be Nineveh's, responding to your call when you're present to us. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather and to worship. We love you and we trust you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So may the love of God and the peace of Christ, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. And may 
you too be given the opportunity to repent, to bear fruit, and to be who God has called you to be. Go in peace.